If you're not acutely aware, JRPGs are my favourite genre. Usually the older the better, which is also my chat up line when I volunteer at the local care home. I like JRPGs, I like talking about them, I like the Switch and if you click this video then I'm guessing you do too. Unless you only click these videos for my jokes about chatting up elderly ladies, then I guess that's fine as well. But here in this video, I've compiled a huge list of essential Nintendo Switch JRPGs, both old and new. To stop this video getting out of hand, all the games in this list have physical releases, are actually JRPGs made in Japan or uh, Asian regions. This is not every JRPG on the Switch, it's not a definitive list, it's just my choice, my recommendations and ones that I've not forgotten. So take that into account, I'd love to know your favourite physical JRPG on the Switch in the comments below. And yes, it's fine if you want to protest the use of the word essential. It's YouTube guys, caveated and nuanced titles and thumbnails, they just don't exist. Let's get on with it. It's impossible to talk about JRPGs without presenting the most prestigious series of the lot of them. You may or may not love Final Fantasy as a series, but you can't deny, around the world, it's the most recognisable name in the genre. And of course, Square Enix liked to share around the Final Fantasy love, especially on the Switch. It took a good few years, but eventually the Switch was drip-fed the goodness, with Final Fantasy 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 available in the awesome Pixel Remaster collection in this delicious physical version. Mine is the Asian version which is readily available, plays in English, and was much better handled than the Western physical which made Square Enix look like absolute jokes. I love this package and I've played the games before multiple times, I even reviewed them for Switch Watch. But of course, physically, there's also the amazing double pack of Final Fantasy 7 and Triple Triad the game. Don't worry, I love Final Fantasy 8, but I love making some overly sensitive fans angry even more. This was available physically in Asia for a good while until eventually Europe did see a nice physical release as well. North Americans, you guys were left out. But the remaster of Final Fantasy 7 Crisis Core got a release everywhere and that is fantastic in terms of production value. The gameplay is awesome. While I don't exactly love what they did with the story, I appreciate that it's still a goddamn good game and worth a purchase. Final Fantasy IX saw a physical release in Asia, and this is considered the cool kid's favourite in the series. I love it too because it's such a love letter to the old school Final Fantasies, it encapsulated them perfectly. Final Fantasy X, amazing, my second favourite, and of course the physical release was bundled with its sequel, Charlie's Angels Fantasy. It's pretty good too, if you go in with the right mindset, personally I'd advise picking this up in its Japanese or Asian physical release since unlike the western one, it has both games on the cartridge, not a download. That's essentially my opinion. And you can't forget Final Fantasy XII, even though I did initially forget it in this list and had to edit it in. My mistake. This is where they really try to modernize Final Fantasy and it has a strange MMO style to the gameplay, but it works. It's definitely not close to be my favorite, but it stands out from the crowd with hugely in-depth character growth systems. World of Final Fantasy Maxima is even more Final Fantasy goodness. It's not a mainline release, but it's a damn fine spin-off. Really charming in how it celebrates the series as you treat famous characters almost like Pokemon, which is genius in my opinion. Sadly in the West, just like Final Fantasy IX, this was only available as a code in a box BS, but Southeast Asia got a great physical release that I highly recommend. While there are not as many Dragon Quest games on the Switch compared to Final Fantasy, which is a travesty in my opinion, there's still a good few that may be worth your time if you like collecting physical games. Dragon Quest 1, 2 and 3 are available in a sweet little triple pack that only released in Asian regions. It's worth noting that not everyone loves these versions, but as someone who played them for the first time in this form, I actually enjoyed them for what they were, a great little history lesson. Dragon Quest XI is a pretty huge one, not only in the size of the game but also its quality. Many people would state this is the best JRPG on the system and I would respect that. While I've not had anywhere near enough time to sink my teeth into it properly, there's one thing that screams out after just 5 minutes, quality. You can tell it's a game where people's heart and soul went into making the best game they could and it just really shows. 
Now there are other games such as Dragon Quest Builders but that's obviously not a JRPG but then there is the amazing Dragon Quest Treasures which is almost a spiritual sequel of sorts to the Dragon Quest Monster series. Although that's coming later this year, which I can't wait for. That's going to be amazing. And then later, there's going to be a Dragon Quest 3 remake. We haven't seen much information about that, and I'm not counting it in this video. But I'm bloody hopeful because it looks like it's going to be amazing with a HD 2D art style. There are two Fire Emblem games on the Switch. Well, that have physical releases. Fire Emblem Three Houses and Fire Emblem Engage. And no, that code in a box nonsense for the first Fire Emblem game does not count. But what's there to say about these strategy RPGs? Essential is probably the word. While Fire Emblem Awakening revived the series and made it viable once more, Three Houses sent it into the stratosphere, almost making it mainstream, which is a miracle in my opinion. Its sequel, Fire Emblem Engage, didn't hit quite as hard, maybe because of the Colgate hair, but uh, there's no denying it's added an excellent release to the Switch's bulking RPG library. Three action JRPGs were included in the excellent little package of the Collection of Mana. Three Seiken Densetsu games in one. Final Fantasy Adventure on the Game Boy, Secret of Mana for the Super Nintendo, and for the first time in English, the utterly gorgeous Super Famicom game, Trials of Mana. This package is worth it for that alone. It took a while to come to the West, but uh, now it's here and it is nicely affordable. I think at some point Square Enix went a bit nuts because around the same time, they released a remake of Trials of Mana, a proper 3D game that didn't exactly have the budget of like Final Fantasy VII Remake. In fact, they probably made it with the change found down the back of the sofa, and I'd arguably say it's not as good as the original, but it's a different kind of perspective, and I would give it a shot. And if you want to give any of these games a shot, you want to purchase them physically, for example, then please click the links below to purchase them from there. That would help support me no end. And it's also awesome because you get a game or two at the same time. For the Western retail releases, I've just put a generic link to a partner store, but due to the potential minefield of some of the import exclusives that I'll mention here, I've put specific links to those to make sure no mistakes were made. And I thank you kindly for your support, it really does mean a lot to me. Legend of Mana is an amazing game. The longer time goes on, the more I love this little mysterious game. It's a non-linear game with many little stories and events that everyone will experience in a different order. There's so many little nuances to this game that it's hard to explain in a small paragraph. Never mind the review I did for Switch Watch, but maybe you can understand it more over there. So go watch that. I love this little action RPG. The physical release was only available in Southeast Asia. The West has another code in a box BS. Don't bother with that. The Saga series is a bit of a niche franchise for Square Enix in the West, but that hasn't stopped them from making plenty of them available on the Switch, and most of them are available physically, although only in Asian regions with English. Romancing Saga Minstrel Song is a 3D remake of the original Romancing Saga game. There's also Romancing Saga 2 and 3, which are enhanced 2D ports. There's Saga Scarlet Grace Ambitions, which is a Vita game. And finally, there is my favorite, Saga Frontier Remastered. All of them are great, but that last one in particular gives me fuzzy feelings. These aren't JRPGs for everyone due to their idiosyncratic nature, following different protagonists in smaller stories, but you should definitely give like one or two of them a try. Again, I would be highly advising Saga Frontier to be your first one. And again, with some imports, you have to be careful which one you buy. Please follow the links in the description. I have guided you properly, okay? Suicoden 1 and Suicoden 2 aren't exactly out at the time of writing this, but they have been announced, and if you've watched some of my retrospectives on Suicoden 1 or 2, I am a huge fan of them, and now they're being remastered for modern consoles. It's amazing, and it's supposedly coming physically, but we just need to be patient, alright? Have some patience with this one. You don't want to rush it, they've got to make this good. Grandia 1 and Grandia 2 are two amazing JRPGs, one originally for the PlayStation and the sequel for the Dreamcast. They're quite different from each other, but both are equally awesome, and after a couple of patches, these ports are actually pretty good. Limited Run did this physically in North America, but if you missed out there, there is a more affordable and better looking Asian physical release. Tales of Symphonia and Tales of Vesperia. 
The Tales of series I feel is one that's sorely underrepresented on the Switch. For some reason there's only two in the series on the system. Sure they're the two most famous ones but still I feel it's a missed opportunity from Bandai. Nevertheless the port of Symphonia leaves something to be desired. You might be better off with the original GameCube version but if not it's still a classic game and I'm pretty sure there's been a patch or two since launch. Vesperia I think I've grown to love even more than Symphonia. If you want great character interactions then these will be the JRPGs for you. That's definitely their strongest aspect. Persona 5 Royal is an amazing game, a game so good Atlas can't stop milking it. It took a damn long time to make it to the Nintendo Switch but many feel the wait was worth it arriving in its definitive edition and the port being surprisingly excellent. It's one of the premier JRPGs on the Switch, one of the biggest in terms of content, in terms of style and production. Sadly Persona 3 and Persona 4 are only available digitally on the Switch, no physical release for whatever nonsensical reason so I can't mention them even though I've just mentioned them. Come on, give them to me physically, come on Atlas. Chrono Cross finally saw the light of day once more from Square Enix. While Chrono Trigger was ported to every system under the sun, its sequel of sorts was stuck on the PS1 until very recently. Ironically, we're still waiting for Chrono Trigger on the Switch. Anyways, this is a really great game, again with a slightly idiosyncratic feeling to it that makes it feel somewhat like a romancing saga game or Legend of Mana. It's available physically but only in Southeast Asia and comes bundled with the spin-off game Radical Dreamers which is a lo-fi text adventure game and it's actually pretty good, great stuff. Various Daylife probably shows its mobile roots just a little bit too much, but the fact it was made by the same people responsible for Bravely Default and Octopath means it's slightly above your normal RPG that you'd find on mobile. This is a job based game that tries to be quite quaint in your world saving, perhaps not the most essential but I love the fact it's available physically in Southeast Asia. Those dudes are always coming to the rescue. Mersion Forest is essential, not in the fact that it's good but that it's almost like a fever dream of a game. As so the developers every six months or so decided to stop working on the current game and start making something completely different but then at the end just stitch them all together. So you have almost three games in one, the first of which isn't really an RPG, it's more like a simple adventure game. The second two however are more in line with RPGs and it's not wonderful but it is wonderfully weird. Tokyo RPG Factory went through a phase where they really lived up to their name. Almost three years in a row they pumped out low budget JRPGs for Square Enix, trying to go for older sensibilities without breaking the bank to make it. Results are mixed but I Am Setsuna is the best of the bunch ahead of Lost Sphere and Oninaki. I Am Setsuna was only physical in Japan and Asia, Lost Sphere worldwide and Oninaki in Japan and Europe. Sorry North America. Compile Heart are an RPG developer known for mixing fan service and decent RPG mechanics within absolutely shallow stories. They have plenty of games on the Switch and I'm sure they have many more to come. But let's take a look at Seven Pirates H, Mugen Souls, its sequel Mugen Souls Z, Moro Chronicles and Crystal H. Lewd and proud and solid mechanics, the nature of their physical release is a bit iffy since they're not exactly game shop shelf worthy so most of them are limited in some capacity. But if you like big boobies and anime girls you might want to take a look at these ones. Taiko no Tatsujin RPG Adventure 1 and 2 are two RPG adventure games if you didn't guess from the name. In terms of physical release they come together on one cartridge in the Japanese or Southeast Asian version and while they aren't exactly hardcore for JRPGs with a compelling story, they are fun romps that mix the JRPG system with the rhythm gameplay the series is usually known for. I love them and I really wish these were more popular than they turned out to be, because sure not everyone wants a JRPG tagged on to a rhythm game but uh, it has a free play mode so you know it has lots of content, so much content. Aria Chronicle is a pretty hard to get physical release, it had a very low print run in Japan with no restocks that I've seen which is a shame because it's a fairly decent game, mixing classic fantasy with the dungeon crawling aspects found in something like Darkest Dungeon. It's certainly one that almost nobody paid attention to aside from myself. How many Atelier games are there on the Switch? There are so many and physically we got most of them, although mostly thanks to the power of awesomeness of Southeast Asia coming to the rescue but before I list them out what is this series about? Well they are wonderful games that combine JRPG battles with exploration, ingredients gathering and then item creation all the while bonding with a cast of lovable characters. 
They can feel a little bit overwhelming, so I wouldn't recommend buying them all immediately. You know, try a couple, see how you feel. So which ones do we have physically? Well, most of them. Let me start with the ones available physically in North America and Europe. There is Lydian Suell, which was the first one available on the Switch. There's Atelier Riser 1, Atelier Riser 2, and 3, which I highly recommend. There's Atelier Sophie 2. There's Atelier Lulua, which I haven't actually played that one, mainly because it's just so difficult say saying it. Atelier Lulua. But then, in Asian regions, there are special English versions of the following. Atelier Sophie 1, Atelier Firis, which is also bundled with Liddy Suell, in the Atelier Mysterious Trilogy Pack. That's three games on one cartridge. Then there is the Atelier Dusk Trilogy Pack, which includes Atelier Aisha, Shaylee, and Escher and Loggy. Plus, there is the super recent remake of Atelier Marie, which is the perfect quaint starting point for the series. So, my calculation, not including the double up of uh, Lady Suell, and then there's a spin off, which is not an RPG, Nelk, there are 12 Atelier JRPGs. They are propping this list up themselves, and I do recommend them. But if you want to start basic, maybe go with Marie, then you can graduate like a big boy to Riser 1. Riser 1 and 2, they are my favorites in the series. Dart Hack GU Last Recode is actually three JRPGs in one package. Rebirth, Reminiscence, Redemption. They all follow the same arc about a meta story of a gamer in an MMO. Each game in the package is short, especially compared to other JRPGs of the PS2 era when they originally released. This helped Bandai pump them out faster and keep costs down. So while coming together as a meaty package, each individual game feels more bite-sized and digestible. This was released physically in North America, but only on Bandai's web store. It did get a wider release in Asian regions, however, so maybe that's a better option for some out there. Toho New World is a new enough action RPG that blends RPG elements in terms of stats, levels, and even exploration and story, but integrates them with bullet hell themes in terms of the combat. While it's not the greatest game in the world, you can see it was made on a small budget. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it was my favorite Toho game that I played up to this point. Fairy Fencer F, Dark Advent, and Refrain Chord are two games that, although they are in the same series and follow on from each other narratively, they play very differently. The first game doesn't run great on the Switch, but it's considered a really decent JRPG. While the second game, which I have played, is a tactical RPG. Total switch up in gameplay, and I really enjoyed it. Very competently made, although the story is a bit of guffage, but you can expect that from this developer. Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon is one of the best Final Fantasy spin-off games in my opinion. Of course, I may have a bit of a bias because I love the Mystery Dungeon gameplay style, but it works so well with the Final Fantasy theme. A Chocobo with job classes, recruitable enemies, mild town building, I love it. It's a great introduction to the Mystery Dungeon genre, if you think it might be a bit too hardcore for you. Try this one, it did get a physical release, but only in Japan with English though. Let me just take a little mini break to remind you that this video was supported by my patrons over on Patreon. Thank you kindly for your support. They get these videos early, ad free, plus loads of bonuses that definitely makes it worth it for them. If you want to see exactly what they get, wait till the end of the video or click the link below to see what it has to offer. Patreon.com slash a bit more Jordan. Thank you ever so much. Mistover is a fairly sought after physical game, mainly because the eShop version has been delisted, so if you didn't buy it already, the only way to play it is physically. Unless you're a pirate, I suppose, but uh, yeah, this is a darkly dungeon crawling RPG, not the greatest, in fact its main interesting selling point is that the physical is highly sought after. Omega Labyrinth Life has a gameplay style that is quite close to my heart. It's almost a mystery dungeon style game, but definitely on the more casual end. It's like Azure Dreams, just less monsters and more boobage. Like ridiculous amounts. There's even a mini game where you touch up the girls and make them squirt some sort of energy juice or something. Don't play this one on the bus, you'll give that grandma a heart attack. Dungeon Encounters is a stripped back RPG. A small all star team of Square Enix employees teamed up on their lunch break to create this faff free dungeon crawling RPG. It's like DD but without the grandeur. It's like someone playing it who likes any kind of visual imagination. And it won't be great for everyone, but for those who want some more pure, less of the fluff, it could be a good one for you. Toho Genso Wanderer Lotus Labyrinth R and Reloaded 
are two dungeon crawling RPGs that we got physically in English. Obviously part of the Toho franchise, or should it be, should it be franchise? I don't know, they're fan games, so I don't want to say franchise because they're not official, they're franchises. I don't know, I feel there's a better word for it. In terms of top-down dungeon crawlers, rarely do they get as mental as this one. It's just craziness. Reloaded we got physically in the West, but Lotus Labyrinth R has a physical release with English in Japan. Alliance Alive is a really overlooked title. This was originally a 3DS game, but came out when the console was pretty much dead, so at least they had sense to re-release it in HD on the Switch. I've already talked about this a little bit in my essential 3DS JRPG list, but I'd say the Switch version is the best way to play. Lost Child isn't the most essential of Shin Megami Tensei ripoffs, but it's a commendable one, I'd say. The issue with this is that it's now being delisted from the eShop, and the physical version is now rather pricey. I hope collectors got in on this one early. Live Alive was a surprising remake from Square Enix, a Super Famicom game that never made it westwards, but using their much-loved 2D HD art style, they brought it to life and hopefully to a new audience. While I've only just picked this one up myself, I am super eager to see how it works works with many different characters to follow in different time periods, giving me a very Romancing Saga vibe. Octopath's Traveler 1 and 2 are two really great JRPGs. The first was massively loved on release due to it being an earlier big budget exclusive for the system. Perhaps retrospectively, despite it being super commendable, it did have its flaws. However, the fairly recent sequel seemed to have almost universal acclaim for fixing the errors made in the original. If you want the best one, go straight for the sequel, but I wouldn't knock you for trying the original one as well. Bravely Default 2 is something I'd consider to be almost in the same series. I know they're not, but Octopath, Bravely Default, they share a lot of the same vibes. I think hype about the series has simmered down over the releases. I mean, these were once hailed as the saviors of the turn-based JRPG genre, but as decently as this sequel reviewed, it just came and went without too much talk about it, which I think is a shame, and it deserves a little bit more attention and support. Go buy it. East is a series you may be familiar with if you watch my retrospective on the first two entries. Well, the series is still going strong, and with East 8, it brought many newcomers to the world of Adol and his adventures. It's an amazing game, with fantastic scope for its budget and the music. Oh my god, the game is worth it for the music alone. East 9 is not something I've played, but I'm told by fans this is almost a culmination of the series, so not the greatest introduction. Perhaps better enjoyed if you're more familiar with the series. Sadly, the only other East games we have in English on the Switch is the equally awesome East Origin. It's a, it's a different kind of vibe, but still essentially in my opinion. In Japan, they also have a remake of East 3, which is a, it's a remake of a remake. And there's also East 10 coming, but there's no word on English right now for those two. Let's keep praying to the goddesses, not only because they're hot. The Legend of Heroes is a series that is Falcom's flagship series, perhaps slightly ahead of East. Totally a different kind of game, but it's just as amazing. Sadly, due to the intertwining nature of the stories, arcs and stuff, it's kind of difficult to enjoy them if you're only a Switch owner. Currently, physically, there's Legend of Heroes, Trails of Cold Steel 3 and 4, which are hard to appreciate if you haven't played 1 and 2. Come on, Falcom, Exceed, NIS America, just, just do what you gotta do. Get your agreements ready, okay? Just make some sort of agreement and get them on the Switch. Help, help gamers out. We need them. The Crossbell arc may be more easy for some people to stomach. While it is connected to the rest of the series, the fact that Trails from Zero and Trails to Azur are considered their own arc means that while it would be nice to start earlier in the series, this is not an awful place to begin your Legend of Heroes adventure. And boy, I think these games look amazing, like utterly amazing. I just need game publishers to see sense so I can start in the right place. Trails into Reverie, I'm told by a, a quick 30 second Google, is that both of the arcs, Cold Steel and Crossbell, both culminate together in the Trails into Reverie game, which at the time of making this video is the latest one on the Switch. So yeah, if you're deep into the Trails series, then you should be adding this to your collection if you haven't already. Labyrinth of Refrain and Labyrinth of Galeria, the Moon Society, are two charming dungeon crawlers, a nice bit of fan service as you delve deep into first-person dungeon crawling turn-based battles. They're kind of just like Ed Tree and Odyssey games, but not as good in some aspects, but offer a slightly different kind of thing, a bit more personality if you will. Speaking of Etrian Odyssey, 
Atlas remade 1, 2 and 3 for the Nintendo Switch. Sadly there was no physical version in the West but there is a nice collection, a physical package in Asia that does have English. I would say this is a bloody great package in terms of games that are at the peak of dungeon exploration. While any kind of narrative takes a back seat, this is all about old school exploration where you even draw your own map which is ace. It's not ideal on the Switch but it works surprisingly well. It's an expensive package but I think it's worth it. Crystar is a JRPG from NIS America that flew under the radar, which could be said for half of their games, but not usually their JRPGs. This one did though, maybe because it released on the PS4 quite a while before, I don't know, but uh, I haven't personally played it, but from people who have played it, people who I respect, they tell me it's a pretty decent time. And that's saying something because usually I don't respect anybody. The Cruel King and the Great Hero is a game that took me by surprise because it's a JRPG that's a sequel to a puzzle platformer. I didn't realize the gameplay style had changed until after it released. Obviously it's quite stripped down and the gameplay isn't exactly the focus but it's such a beautiful game nonetheless. Love the storybook presentation and it will look lovely in your collection. Monarch is a game that was more popular with RPG gamers than actual critics who said it was mildly mediocre, but since release there's been a decent amount of positivity about Monarch. It's a strategy RPG made by Furyu who made Alliance Alive and the next series that I'm going to talk about, The Caligula Effect 1 and 2. These are very NIS America style games, meaning that while they are decently made, you kind of just wish you were playing the real thing. By which I mean Persona, because these are more budgeted attempts at a Persona game. The second game is considered a step up from the first, and having sampled them both, I definitely feel the second game is worth your time after you've finished up with your latest Persona playthrough. They really tried to nail the same vibe with the user interface and music and story, it's pretty decent guys. There are a ton of Disgaea games on the Switch, almost overwhelmingly so, especially considering the cover art for a lot of them looks the same, it's hard to tell them apart, not only visually but uh, gameplay wise as well. But as they say, if it ain't broke, don't balls it up by trying to be clever, or something like that. Either way, you can't go wrong with one or two of these in your collection, as they not only give plenty of gameplay hours, but also humour as well. Disgaea 1, 4, 5 and 6 are currently on the Switch in English, and 7 should not be too far away as I'm writing this. Saviour of Sapphire Wings and Stranger of Sword City are a double pack of games that no one's ever heard of, so uh, they bundle them together into one package. And yeah, I've never played them, but if I did, I'm pretty sure I'd enjoy them because uh, they offer the kind of dungeon crawling gameplay I rather enjoy. They look like simple games, but for what I've seen, they offer a fair amount of content, especially with both games together on one cartridge. Langrissa 1 and 2 are remakes of a series that was once thought to be a rival to Fire Emblem, especially since these were on the Mega Drive rather than the Super Nintendo. The West didn't know that, and so these actually may have more nostalgia for you, even if they don't hold up anywhere near as close. These are decent games, packed with content, but maybe the balance isn't quite right. They still have a lack of polish, a lack of thought, quality of life stuff that they always had. They didn't change much for these remakes. Destiny Connect is a really decent introductory JRPG for kids. It's got a very Disney style to it. Now I'm not talking about ruining your people's childhood memories, I'm talking about the whimsical storytelling and young cast of characters. Is it actually essential? No, but I did enjoy playing it and with a bit more polish in some areas, it could have been amazing. God Wars has been around the block a bit, originally a Vita game. This complete edition on the Switch came early in the system's life. A tactical RPG, very competently made, dozens of hours worth of gameplay, however it seems NIS America lost the rights to the game and it's been delisted from the eShop, so physical is the only way to go. At the time of writing, Video Games Plus had at least a couple of reprints left, but I don't know if they'll be in stock by the time I edit this video together. It's a bit of a beast. The Longest 5 Minutes is a really fascinating game. The game starts with the heroes failing, and you play out the final 5 minutes of the failing encounter with the final boss. As you struggle against it, you recount your adventure up to this point. Therefore, it has quite a unique storytelling device. It's not amazing in terms of gameplay, but it's certainly interesting. A bit of retro feeling with the personality of something like Earthbound. 
NIS America have gone nuts in recent years. Realizing the Nintendo Switch was a potential gold mine, they've been porting their old school PS2 and PSP releases in double pack compilations. Aside from the almost certain game breaking bugs, these are amazing games. When Nipponichi Software were at their peak in my opinion, with Phantom Brave, Soul Nomad, Makai Kingdom, ZHP, La Pucelle, and Rhapsody across three volumes. Good stuff, and most of the broken aspects have now been fixed in a patch. Rhapsody 1 and 2 have very recently been released together on the Switch for the first time in English. Rhapsody 2 was a PS1 game, while 3 was on the PS2. I've never played the first game, but I did get an early preview code for this double pack, and I immediately fell in love with the series. I need to go back and play them in order. Maybe I'll even cover them for this channel in a big retrospective. It's like the birth of Disgaea before they got like too over the top and nuts. Many say they are girly RPGs, and I can see that, but as someone who's comfortable with things that I like and dislike, I am man enough to say these are, they seem like they're going to be amazing. They have like full on musical numbers to tell the story, it's amazing. Labyrinth of Zangetsu is one of the many old school first person dungeon crawlers. It's a crowd that's super hard to stand out in, but this one certainly manages it well thanks to its amazing ink art style. And that's the main selling point, but the gameplay is to a decent standard as well. This was a fairly low key release. There wasn't much publicity from PQ, which is a shame, but I guess, you know, the audience is quite niche. Nexomon and Nexomon Extinction are a great alternative to Pokemon, especially if you're tired of the pandering to those pesky kids. Even though this has family friendly vibes, they want to err towards the old school Pokemon rather than modern outings, and many of the disenfranchised Poke fans say that Nexomon is better. There's a handy double pack of the original game made for mobile and its console sequel, give them both a try. Metal Max Xeno Reborn should be the greatest game ever. It's basically an anime with a Mad Max JRPG and it's worth playing for that aspect alone. Even if the execution isn't as amazing as the premise, I'm super happy this is on the Switch. I even have the collector's edition. Maglum Lord is another P-Cube release that they didn't really publicize much, but hey, at least they're releasing them. This is a solid action RPG that lives up to its lower budget development team and Japanese publisher. It has really nice art style and gameplay, although the story is perhaps quite forgettable. Shin Megami Tensei 3 and Shin Megami Tensei 5 are both on the Switch, 3 being an older PS2 game, not exactly having the best port to the Switch, but that doesn't take too much away from the awesome hardcore experience, while 5 is still currently an exclusive and one of the more mature JRPGs on the system as you smack talk enemies into joining you in battle. It's one of the higher quality JRPGs and feels like a lot of effort was put into it. Although maybe you can see Atlas don't love it quite as much as the Persona spin-offs these days. Nino Kuni 1 and 2 are two amazing games. Beautiful RPGs from Bandai. While they're from the same series, they do play rather differently from each other and that's perhaps why I enjoy the first game slightly more. That game is bloody magical in every sense of the word from the presentation, the story, the gameplay is wonderful. Nino Kuni 2, also a pretty great game, but I think it suffered due to the lack of partnership with Studio Ghibli this time around, who were at that time clearing their desks out. Get both, they're pretty cheap if found in the right place, but if you can only get one of them, get the first one. It would be relatively rubbish of me if I had this list of JRPGs, but neglected some of Sega's classics available on the Sega Genesis collection. That has 50 games on it, and some of them are great JRPGs. Sword of Vermilion, Shining Force 1, 2, Shining in the Darkness, and how can we forget the Fantasy Star 2, 3, and 4? This package is worth it for those Fantasy Star games alone, big value for money. Valkyria Chronicles 4 is available physically on the Switch, sadly the first game eluded the physical medium, but all I'll say is, buying 4 brand new at the time of release cost me an absolute arm and a leg, just to get an import version. Just a reminder, I live in China, and Asian versions they don't have English, but uh, Goddamn, I needed Valkyria Chronicles in my life because there's so much DNA of Skies of Arcadia in here. Completely different game and style, but you can certainly feel that they're made by the same teams. Was the extortionate price worth it? Hell yes, such a great blend of real-time and turn-based mechanics. Baton Kytus 1 and 2 are almost upon us, coming in in a nice double pack. Sadly, North America wasn't deemed worthy of a physical release, at least that's known at the time of writing this, but Europe and Asian regions will be getting the physical goods. These are RPGs that originally found life on the GameCube, 
I have never played them because I really didn't know what they were, but I've been told they're pretty amazing, even if they do involve cards a lot, and I'm fighting my bias, I really am. Plus, they were made by the same team as Xenoblade, so uh, they must be awesome. There are a handful of Digimon games on the Switch, especially physically, often put head-to-head -head with its largest rival, Pokemon. The Digimon games have hardly set sales on light, but that's not to besmirch the quality, because most of them are really ace. Cyber Sleuth 1 and 2 are available in a great double pack. Survive has an interesting mix of visual novel and turn-based strategy, maybe not essential for RPG fans, but visual novel fans, you know, you've already got a boner hearing about that. And Digimon World Next Order is a remake of an older title that wasn't as well loved as some of their earlier efforts, but you know, some tweaks here and there, and being on the Switch, your monster trainers, you can't go wrong with any of them. Sword Art Online is a series that eludes me into what it actually is because I see the word MMO and anime tie-in and then I panic that I'd be heading into an impenetrable nightmare, but that's just me. There are three Sword Art Online games on the Switch and in terms of being physical, all of them are available in Europe, North America. They were just probably as confused about the series as myself, so they didn't get the physical release. There's Fatal Bullet, Hollow Realization, and the latest one, I can't say it, I just like to call it Licorice Adventure. Super Robot Wars is an incredible series that only seems to get better as time goes on. It's a series of strategy RPGs that are basically fangasms from someone who bloody loves mech anime. Loads of anime series come together in a crossover story and feel like you're taking part in an anime. And the icing on the cake is that the battle animations are phenomenal. Jaw dropping almost, bloody love these games. They all got physical releases in Asian regions, but you have to be careful which ones you buy since some of the versions don't have English. So make sure if you want to purchase this, which of course you do, then check my links in the description because they will guide you. There is Super Robot Wars T, V, X, and the latest one, 30. Empire of Angels 4 is a surprisingly commendable strategy RPG, something you may not be expecting just looking at the art style, but it is good, well designed and rather charming. Physically, this is available only at PlayAsia, so uh, check the links for that and don't forget my discount code, which will probably change in the future. SD Gundam Crossrays and SD Gundam Genesis, uh, similar to the Super Robot Wars series, except instead of sprites, they use 3D models. These are utterly packed games that follow snippets of famous segments in your favorite anime arcs across the Gundam universe. I don't think they're quite as epic as Super Robot Wars, but they're still awesome and should be in your collection. Again, you have to be careful which ones you buy, bit of a minefield, so follow the links so I can guide you safely and earn a bit of cash for my efforts. I honestly prefer Super Robot Wars and SD Gundam games over Fire Emblem. Sure, they're less strategic, but they're way more epic. Twin Blades of the Three Kingdoms is a tactical RPG with the Three Kingdoms. That should make it the best game ever, right? Sadly, okay, it's not exactly that. It's uh, It just looks like an RPG maker game, but although, from what I'm told, it's actually, you know, pretty decent. Visually, ignore the visuals, they're awful, but the gameplay-wise, it's okay. Shirin the Wanderer is a bit of a legend in my eyes, pretty much the leader of the mystery dungeon gameplay style, which is something I'm a huge fan of. I can't wait to tell you how amazing Azure Dreams is, but uh, this is kind of where it all started. Not exactly the game, but uh, you know, the series and the physical version was handled by Limited Run Games in North America, while Japan also got a copy with English. Katana Kami is an action RPG dungeon crawler where you are a blacksmith by day, demon slayer by night. This is a pretty packed hardcore game that I'm surprised didn't get a physical release elsewhere in the world, but no, only in Japan. But it does have English, so that's good. One for mature audiences. Diofield Chronicle is a game often forgotten about, and it's from Square Enix. This was when they were absolutely on it in terms of pumping out games, especially of the strategy kind. This is a cross between real-time and turn-based, and I think it was overlooked due to the heavyweights of the genre that surrounded it in a similar release window. Tactics Ogre Reborn is an essential strategy RPG. If you've been needing that Final Fantasy Tactics fix, this is the best place to look. This is a remake of a remake pretty much, but that doesn't stop it from being one of the top tier games on the system. If it wasn't for Tactics Ogre, Final Fantasy Tactics probably wouldn't exist. I did hear they changed some pretty big things between this and the PSP release, which may have rubbed some people the wrong way, but hey, you should get it anyways. Star Ocean 2 is from a B tier franchise of Squares. That doesn't mean that it should be disregarded. This is an upcoming remake that looks to be a big visual departure from the original. And although I am a big lover of HD 2D, I think I prefer the original in this case. I just like the art style. 
that almost tangible feeling, but hey, you can't go wrong with HD 2D, I suppose. Unlike the remake of the first game, this is getting a physical release, thankfully. Rune Factory 3, 4, and 5. Rune Factory is a series that mixes action RPG with farming life simulation to amazing effect. Rune Factory 3 and 4 are older games that released on the DS and 3DS respectively before being ported to the Switch, but they are still better than Rune Factory 5, which uh, many people enjoyed, but uh, I felt like it was a bit of a step down in terms of quality and gameplay loop. Either way, I can definitely vouch for Rune Factory 3, which I play so much on my DS. Harvestella is Square Enix trying to get in on some of that action. It's Final Fantasy meets Rune Factory, and it's still an exclusive to the Switch at the time of writing this. A pretty commendable game, even if there's some lessons to be learned if a sequel ever pops up, but it's nice to see Square branching out, trying to create new franchises, rather than just labeling it Final Fantasy Farming. Deserves a purchase for that restraint alone. Nier Automata is a classic action RPG, at least that's what people tell me, even though I never asked, I get it, it's deep and stuff, pensive, philosophical, and there's a hot robot babe that you drew naughty fan art for, and no, I don't want to see it, my wife's sitting next to me, maybe later. Apparently the Switch port is pretty excellent, and I should probably get around to playing it, even though the amount of people who went on about it back in the day kind of feels like I've already played it. There are two. The World Ends With You games on the Switch, the original, and the sequel subtitled Neo. And frankly, the marketing team on this one should be fired, because the sequel flopped mostly because no one knew it was a new game. The covers look almost exactly the same, you literally can't distinguish the two without really looking at them, and the name, Neo, insinuates it's just like a newer version of The World Ends With You. But uh, that's derailed this segment because both of them are excellent examples of action RPGness with unique and brilliant mechanics. The style is off the scales. Triangle Strategy is perhaps the peak of strategy RPG renaissance from Square Enix. Last year they were on fire. And even though Tactics Ogre may have been the best of the classic games, of the newer releases this is an utterly incredible experience and really made people get that feeling of Final Fantasy Tactics as it was, but just under a different name, a slightly more stupid name. The marketing team, uh, god, they really need to get the game developers in a headlock and tell them to stop making the games hard to sell, but to ignore the bad name, get this. Cross Tales is a fairly recent tactical RPG published by Kemco. Now that's a bit of a warning sign, but I tell you what, ignore that, because if you love Final Fantasy Tactics, you owe it to yourself to try Cross Tales. Obviously, it's not as good as Final Fantasy Tactics, nothing is. But they really, they really studied what made Final Fantasy Tactics so well loved, and they just emulated it so well with every aspect, and added their own small twists here and there without making it completely different. They found the perfect balance, Cross Tales, only available physically in Japan and Asia, and it is genuinely a good time, no matter what you think. It is, okay? It is. Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu, Eevee, Pokemon Sword Shield, Diamond Pearl, Arceus, Scarlet, Violet, as you may expect, there are a fair few Pokemon games on the Switch, most of them being mainline proper JRPGs. From the beginner-friendly remake of Let's Go, to the overly faithful remake of Diamond and Pearl, Two new generations in Sword and Shield and then Scarlet and Violet, plus the anomaly that is Legends Arceus. There's endless amounts of content for Pokemon fans. While my personal love affair for Pokemon ended with the DS, it's been great to introduce the series to my daughter, and although the amount of Pokemon is massively overwhelming for both of us, she does enjoy them, and so do many millions of people out there. They're popular for a reason. Metopia is a JRPG developed by Nintendo internally, which is not something that happens often, but this isn't your regular RPG, it's a comedy RPG that chooses your own adventure, stage play kind of thing. It's riddled with comedy gold and the Nintendo magic that makes you totally forget you're playing a JRPG style game. Definitely want to play if you enjoyed the likes of Tomodachi Life. Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE was one of my favourite Wii U games. Yeah, I was one of those poor suckers, and although this wasn't exactly the Fire Emblem Shin Megami Tensei crossover I was expecting, I absolutely love this game. It's more like a Persona game, but super light, with a quarter of the budget. So please, don't look over this, it's a fantastic game and I highly recommend everyone to try it. Happy go lucky Persona! Chained Echoes does not have a physical release as of yet, but it almost certainly will do in at least half a decade's time when 
first press games decided to get off their asses and produce the cartridges people have already paid money for. So this was a really great revelation when it released an indie RPG trying some SNES classicness and almost succeeding. In fact, its success has only been slightly outdone by the unbelievable hype surrounding Sea of Stars, which is coming very soon. And yes, Sea of Stars has been confirmed for a physical release, we just don't know when. Fingers crossed it's not limited run because the game deserves way better than that. Trinity Trigger was a game made by a trio of legends in the industry and this was aiming for something like Secret of Mana. And from the feedback I've got from viewers on Switch Watch, it pretty much succeeds and makes for a fantastic time, especially in a multiplayer sense. Yeah, three players play together like in the original Trials of Mana and I think it's essential. Grab a friend or kidnap them if need be. Mato Anomalies is a super stylish turn-based RPG. It didn't exactly get universal acclaim, but I still think it's worth a look. It has a dual protagonist gameplay style, one as a detective finding clues and the other kicking ass. It's rough around the edges, but as long as you don't go in expecting a big budget persona style game, which many people were hoping for, you're an idiot. Have lower expectations, just enjoy it. Record of Agarest War is an older strategy RPG title from the PS3 era. I think it was doing modern Fire Emblem even before modern Fire Emblem existed. As you get closer to your colleagues and then make babies with them. Oh yeah, this is the generation game. Get producing your offspring to fight for your wars. Wonderful parenting. Physically, this is only available in North America for some reason. Death End Request 1 and 2 are two RPGs I'm not entirely familiar with. In fact, any game that Idea Factory produced, for some reason my brain automatically decides to deny me any information on it, but they do have their fans, and Death End Request certainly has their fans. Demon Gaze Extra is an old school style dungeon crawler, originally one of the great examples of the genre on the PS Vita, but now on the Switch, it's extra, much extra. The West had to wait a long time to get this physical from Red Art Games, but the wait was worth it, although maybe the price could have been like a bit cheaper for some, but uh, yeah, it was quite expensive. There is a lot of content here though, especially with all the extra stuff added for this release. Blue Reflection Second Light is a JRPG from the same company that gave us the billion Atelier games. You can just see it, it's made by the same very nice engine, the great art style. This is the second game in the series. Sadly, the first game was never ported to the Switch, but that's fine. Playing this is a nice treat, especially if you're fans of Gus's other work, but need a break from brewing potions. Undernaught's Labyrinth of Yomi is another old school style dungeon crawler. I absolutely love the vibe this one's going for. Sadly, due to how niche it is, the price is quite high to get a physical version these days. This is highly rated for the niche audience that it serves. Has amazing artwork, set during an interesting period, the late 70s, so it's got some vibe that no other game out there has. Get this if you enjoy a serious dungeon crawler. Mary Skelter Finale and Mary Skelter 2 are available physically. This is a bit of a blind spot for me and I'm just going on like other people's opinions on this and by other people's opinions I mean people who watch Switch Watch. If you like dungeon crawlers you'll get something out of these two physical releases. Witch Spring 3 has mobile feelings to the game, mainly because that's its origins of the series, but as a top-down attempt at something like an Italian game with an appealing art style and simple but easily picked up mechanics, I think it's got a lot going for it. Don't go in expecting something like Massively Deep. If you want a nice pick up and play title that's breezy but still feels like a good JRPG, you may want to take a look at this one. Dragon Star Veneer isn't anything to do with a cheap tacky piece of wood. Dragon Star Veneer is actually a JRPG, a fairly immersive fantasy world that mixes combat and dungeons in a decent way. For a game with an obvious budget, it looks really nice and although it's not easy to get a hold of these days, for those looking for something a bit more niche, you may want to look into it. Monster Hunter Stories 2 is a great JRPG that's not talked about too much, which is weird because it's from Capcom and is a spin-off of one of their biggest gaming franchises that they have, in fact one of the biggest in the world. Monster Hunter has gone RPG, has some light Pokemon elements with many saying the production value and effort put into it trumps Pokemon in like every aspect. And you know what, this ain't too expensive these days, go grab it. Kowloon High School Chronicle is one I want to quickly mention since I want more people to talk about it. Sadly, it released physically only in Europe, but I understand why. It's an old school PS2 game that was originally only in Japanese, and it mixes visual novel style storytelling with dungeon crawling. Not amazing, but I goddamn love the style and feel of this one. Reminds me of the good old days. And there we have it. 
all the games I think are essential JRPGs on the Switch that have physical releases. Sorry to all those suckers who don't have physicals like Persona 4, but hey, I think we've got enough and I've not missed anything huge, have I? What's with all these pitchforks? Why are you throwing eggs at my window? That's a waste. I could make an omelette with them. What do you mean I'm missing something? Oh, yeah, okay. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Pretty much the entire series of the best JRPGs on the system. At least from a modern perspective. Yeah, this is why the Nintendo Switch is such a great console for the genre. These are absolutely essential. They are packed with so much content, so much thought into every intertwining system. It's hard to believe they were created in the modern era, but they are. They're very, very special. And I think everyone in this universe, even those little UFOs that supposedly visit us to laugh at us, should play Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition because they would laugh no more. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's why alien rumors and government meetings are happening more and more often because these aliens, they've played this and they've decided it was time to reveal themselves. Thanks, Nintendo. And there we truly have it. What do you think? The Switch is a beast, and yet there's still a few years to go for its lifespan. It could be the greatest JRPG machine of all time. And uh, if you want to support the channel, you can do so by looking on Patreon with the link in the description for ad-free videos early. You also get bonus content in terms of videos. You get behind-the-scenes updates, access to a secret Discord with smaller updates, and you can vote for stuff. You can also support me by buying something using the links in the description. That massively helps me. And of course, subscribing, hitting that bell button, leave a thumbs up and a comment. Check out my other stuff. And a big shout out to my super producers, FF14 Best JRPG, Jcross7776, Vey, Sven Nowlets, Alexander Kato, and Wixit. Absolute legends. And you could be too if you join them.